Good morning. Um, sorry for the uh, foul up. Um, this is the Dr. Obertashaka show. And um, this is a very special show. They all are, particularly these um, last ones that have been dealing with knowing the God within. Um, the first thing I want to do is thank all the viewers uh, for the interest and kind comments you've made about the show. And um, I also want to thank people for raising questions and um, whatever criticism you have to offer, I welcome it to improve the show. And uh, this is rewarding because I'm enjoying this and um, I'm in a better position to improve the show if I know um, how you're reacting to it. So I really want to thank people for that and for their kindness. Also, um, I, I often forget, but I want people to um, hit the subscriber button and encourage people that you bring on to hit the subscriber button because on YouTube and Facebook, um, you reach more people, uh, the more subscribers you have, your algorithms are stronger. And right now there's a lot of things that I can't do because it's a new show. Uh, so, you know, I, I want to thank you for that. And all the new Facebook friends who have uh, been hitting me up, <laughs> thanks. And I found some people that I haven't seen in years and uh, that's nice. And including my stepson, Reginald Timms, who uh, is out there and uh, he's got his Masonic Lodge watching this. Uh, Reggie's old school brother. He wears boots like people wore in the 20s. <laughs> old school. So I want to thank all of you. Um, so this show is the third part of a four-part series. And so in the first one, uh, we dealt with basically the basic idea that God is within us and with despiritualization. And anyone that's just coming into one show, they need to look at all of these. These are designed to um, enable you to understand better the powers that you have within yourself. The uh, second show um, was dealing with uh, the heart and mind, and uh, particularly with SIA, exceptional intellectual clarity. And a lot of other things. And this third show today uh, is entitled, A Part of Knowing God Within Us is Knowing and Being Our Ka or Our Destiny. This show will focus on Ka and destiny. And, and I really want to stress something. I'm not dealing with theory. Theory is a guess. I'm dealing with stuff that's real. Now, I don't claim to have all the answers, I'm only focusing on what I know. Uh, but I can tell you what I'm dealing with here is real and um, it's confirmed by your own experience because a lot of people out there will uh, relate to some part of this because they have experienced this uh, themselves spiritually. So um, that's these three shows. And then of course today, the fourth show, um, the, the last show of this series, and this is an introductory thing, so it's, it's not like this is going to be the end of this discussion, is going to focus on down home. I'm, I'm, you know, I hope you've noticed that while I've been heavily using Dogon and um, comedic references, and it's the only time I wear the same outfit more than once, but it's to honor the Dogon ancestors. Um, you'll always see me referencing back to African-American culture, what I call new African culture, African-American spirituality, which is the spirituality of all people. We all have our own spin and our own uh, beauty that we add to this. So the uh, last of this introductory series is going to be entitled The Philosophy of the Spiritual Blues. And why did I choose this topic? Because the African-American art form is the highest expression of our culture. And the spiritual blues 
what people call the spirituals, but is actually the spiritual blues, is a foundation of our art form. And along with the culture, these are the two popular cultures of the United States and of the world. And so we often, out of a sense of um, thinking that we have been broken, we often uh, neglect our own and the rest of the world doesn't. So this is gonna be the subject for uh, the um, last of these introductory series. And this is gonna come on April the 3rd, not next week because I need more prep time. I'm bringing in my cinematographer, my filmmaker, and um, it's gonna be a stand up thing rather than sit down. When you deal with pure beauty, you know, you gotta, you know, honor it, respect it. And if you go to the, my best piece so far on all these shows, over 21 of them, uh, is the spiritual blues. And you should check that out. It is beautiful. Got some beautiful music in it, but basically it's showing you the African basis of this. This is contrary to what you think. And that's one of my specialties is music. African-American music, all forms of it. Uh, so that will be coming on, on uh, April the 3rd. And we'll have uh, something on next week uh, in between. So the topic for today is um, a part of God, knowing the part of God within us, the Ka or our destiny. Knowing the part of God that is within us, our Ka or our destiny. Um, this discussion today follows the uh, first that focused on despiritualization as a major obstacle to understanding that God is within us. Because if you really believe that all the material things that you see um, in your life are just material, then it's gonna be hard for you to see the God within you because what uh, quantum physics calls energy is a spirit of God that's within everything. And of course, it's within us in a very special way, because as, as we started to see, and a lot of us who watch this show know, uh, the God within us brings great intelligence and uh, great power, not the kind of power that we see in the despiritualized de world where you're seeking to control things, but where you're drawing on this power to um, increase uh, your own ability to help yourself and uh, help humanity. So um, that is um, really the purpose of this. Now, before getting directly into this topic uh, for today, the COP, I want to deal with the few obstacles that get in the way of us understanding the God that dwells within us. I made the observation that um, in one of the previous shows that the Aryan system of separating spirit from matter, including in theory, separating humans from spirits uh, combined with racism has created a broken society. And we can see we're living in one now. You know, this uh, COVID crisis is just one of many um, where you have no health care and you have no real care for poor people um, and people are left to their own devices and you had a real broken president who one of his advisors said was the most flawed human being he ever knew. And so he's administering the response, which was a killer response. So we see that um, there are obstacles in our road to seeing our own inner powers. And some who are watching the show have overcome them and then others are, are on their way to overcoming them. So by separating spirit from matter, this poses a big obstacle for us knowing or even believing that God dwells within us. Though most Africans in this country and around the world believe that God is within us. I don't care what their religion is. 
that is their orientation. One of the viewers to this show uh, in making a comment and it was public, so I think that she doesn't mind me sharing this. She said, and she was really responding to this sense of brokenness that she feels broken and often confused even on where she should stand politically. And I don't fully know um, exactly what she's talking about. I know that in, in this feeling of being broken that it can be a whole lot of things that have happened to each of us that can definitely put us in crisis and um, generate some of those feelings for some. And so I don't know, and I'd like to communicate more uh, with the sister who uh, made that comment, but it is clear that broken systems do create a sense that you're broken a sense that you're broken. Um, so in, in some cases, you know, where, uh, you know, we're into uh, some deep inner crisis, we may need some professional help. And that may be part of it. Um, a lot of it has to do with us going inside ourselves and drawing from our own powers. A key thing in dealing with this, and this is something that the society does everything to negate, is we need to draw on the inner powers inside of ourselves to unconditionally love ourselves because the greatest healing comes from there. Um, and the basic truth of life is this, you can't love anyone else until you love yourself. And you certainly can't love God unless you love the self, which includes God within. So unconditional love is, is really the key, which is accepting your whole self, the strengths, your weaknesses. And when you do that, it may well be that you can't possibly see yourself as broken. You may be harmed, you may be abused. There may be things that, may be things that have happened to you, but you have a whole self and that whole self is a God within you and it's other things as well uh, that we're gonna get into. So one of the keys to self-love is self-knowledge. And we've been dealing with this on the level of knowing the God within us. You can't love something until you know it. You can't love yourself until you know yourself. Some of us are so alienated from self that it's even hard for us to deal with quiet time because we have inner turmoil going on inside of us. And it's understandable why you would have inner turmoil, rage and all kinds of things. It's understandable, you know? Uh, but the key thing is when uh, you know yourself and then that's the basis for self-respect, respect yourself, then that is really the basis for love of self, love of God, love of anybody else. A lot of us are searching for love in other people, in relationships. And, and that's a very important uh, level of love. In fact, the greatest growth occurs in relationships, personal relationships, marriage, or now what you're now calling committed relationships or whatever you call it, that's where you really grow. And love is about growing. So, these are all very important. And then when you do that, you know, you're, you, you know, you're developing a deeper sense of appreciation of yourself. And when you can unconditionally love yourself, then you can do the same with others without judging, because that is a big mistake. Uh, God really doesn't judge. You're going to see in a minute, you have that built into you. You know what I mean? <laughs> Believe it or not. Um, so the level we've been dealing with of self-knowledge is the knowledge of God. But this show is also based on a fundamental thing. It's a system of transformation that I call the sixfold stages to mental freedom. And um, these are the awakening stages that uh, myself and a brother named Bulun Layla uncovered, Bulun Layla Wabogo, uh, in the 60s. 
I learned from him, but my main learning came from my own awakening. Because generally, for me, I learn a lot from practice. And so the awakening that I underwent and then exchanging notes with Bula and Layla, we were able to chart stages people go through when they're waking up. And that enables you not only to know where you're at on the stages, in this case, of Black and African consciousness. So there is the knowledge of God, but there's the knowledge of self. And if you don't have pride in self, and if you don't have love of self, and in this case, the African and African-American, a Black self, then it's going to be very difficult for you to love God or for you to love yourself. And a lot of what happens with us on the issue of Africa, which a lot of us don't want to deal with, we'll deal with Black now, but not Africa, uh, is that we've been given false pictures of Africa and we've internalized them. And so we end up not liking those pictures. And as such, we turn off to any information on God, uh, uh, on Africa, and uh, particularly any study of it. But a key uh, link to the love of God is the love of self. And the key to the love of self is the personal self, and that's your gifts, and that's what we're going to be talking about later, but it's also your identity. And that's something that the Kemites didn't have to deal with, the Yoruba, all those, before the coming of colonialism and slavery. It's only then that, uh, as Chenwe Achebe says, things fall apart. And it's at that point we begin to question our own identity. One of the viewers and one of the questions that was raised uh, some time ago I think on the first show, he said, well, if our spirituality is so great, how do we get defeated by the Europeans? And so that becomes an excuse for us to turn our back on our history, on our culture, and to imitate Europeans. And guess what? All people have downs, all people have ups. And guess what? You live in an African philosophy, life is slow dying. No civilization lives forever. And it's a good question of what happened in terms of our fall. But the key thing is, in the case of civilization, um, it's, it's a matter of learning from that so that we can come back in a different form. So don't use the fact that you got conquered to turn your back on your history. That's exactly what the conqueror does. What he does is when he gets control of your present, he goes back and distorts your past. Now that's that's his job. That's what he's supposed to do. What you're supposed to do is recover it and don't fall for the okie doke. That's an old saying, you know, the Kool Aid, you know, the story, the dope. Because I know dope means something else for the younger generation. Don't fall for the lies. So a key part of overcoming brokenness is drawing from our roots, the positive parts, and understanding the negative and discarding them, whether it's enslavement, colonialism, um, or the errors we made in the ancient past. So the fact that we got conquered, we did a lot of conquering too, and but we weren't out to control the world. Um, is no excuse for you not knowing yourself, because if you don't, you will remain conquered. And the first thing that will conquer you is your, their mind that'll get in your head. And their view of your identity, which you end up adopting on remote control. And as I pointed out before, um, my mind was once on remote control. So I didn't know it was until I woke up. And the people who are watching this show are the woke people or the ones who are undergoing awakening. And what you need to be doing is pulling on those that aren't bringing them in, whether it's to this show or other information. And, and, and I really want to say, while these shows are important, there's no substitute for reading. You can't lead unless you read. And you don't have to be a leader of a group, leader of yourself. You really can't lead yourself unless you read. And most of us now, as I say, there are three nets out there, the ignorant net, the in, info net, and the afro net. A lot of people are watching the ignorant net. 
and its sound bites, its rage, its opinions, and its assumptions. The ASS is what you sit on. That's not what you should be thinking with. You, I think you all know what I'm talking about. People who got large followings and they're talking loud, as James Brown said, and saying nothing. And a lot of us are drawing our information from that. I know a lot of the people watching this show are reading, but hit some books. And if you want, you, uh, you know, make the little comments on the comment page, you know, when, when the show goes on and uh, leave your email address and I'll send you an introductory reading list. Some of you don't need it. Some of you are reading real deep stuff and some have read me to the bone. <laughs> Loud Azu, who's on this show, um, he's read my stuff and then he's questioning now, are these sources good? That shows a thinking person, you know what I mean? So read. So a part of developing unconditional self-love is um, loving who you are as an African, as a black person. And if you're of another ethnicity of color, it's the same thing. And what I always say about white people is the only way they're gonna get rid of uh, hate is to get rid of whiteness. Get rid of that idea of free white in 21, that somehow your color entitles you to everything. I was reading something recently where Miles Davis was at the White House and some white woman asked him, who was he? What entitled you to be here? And he said, well, uh, I've innovated four schools of music, four new sounds. What have you done other than being white? <laughs> I said, go on, Miles. <laughs> and you can't sit on your blackness either, your Africanness either, you know? It's what have you done? Because when you face that final thing upstairs, it's going to be what you did, not what have, you know, what you say about what you did. It's what you did. That's what we're here for. And that's really what this show today is uh, really focusing on. So through knowing our roots, our history, then we have a deeper sense of a level of self. So we're going to be taking people through these sixfold stages of mental freedom. The problem is, if it's just a mental journey, it won't be enough. You'll be doing the same thing the European does. That is, you get information and you feed it back. It's got to be transformational. And so I have a team of people that I've taken through this over 50 years. And this has not only shaped their lives, but their children and their grandchildren. And so they're going to be helping me on this part. But there's going to be a part where we go through what one of my best people, uh, Thabiti M. Tambuzi, who's uh, quite a, a man. He was a former student of mine, a little multimillionaire. He told me he's going to be a millionaire. He is. Um, and uh, his friend calls him a humanitarian capitalist. <laughs> me, I don't capitalism like hell, but he is. He, he, he does good things for the community. And uh, he calls this process immersion. And so to do that, it's not gonna be enough for you to get information. It's putting it inside yourself. That's gonna, at a cer certain point, we wanna get to a 10 to 12 week thing. It'll be a two or three hour, you can call it a class, but it's gonna be immersion. We break people down into small groups and really take you through the process. This only works when you tie it to your life. This only works when you are trying to do something to better the condition of our people and humanity. If it's just an intellectual exercise, then it's another case of African information, but through a despiritualized process. And that's how most of us learn anyway. So we can talk one thing and walk another, and that's the main reason. So this process, that when we had this beautiful show with Baba Zak Kondo on the assassination of Malcolm X, he was referring to how Malcolm, when he underwent his transformation, he became a very disciplined person. His mind was very disciplined. Now that is, um, that's true. But what, can, what was the basis for that discipline? He got rerooted in his culture. Before that, 
Malcolm didn't like being around black people in prison. He didn't talk to black people. He didn't get his mother's message of just because your skin is lighter, don't think you're white. And she could have passed for a white woman. She was a Grenadian, very proud of being black. And Malcolm didn't really get that message because of the way in which his family was broken. Yet all the other members, including younger family members, didn't break the way Malcolm did because Malcolm was family. The foundation of Malcolm was family. I've written a book called The Political Legacy of Malcolm X. And I'm the first scholar to point that out. Since then, The Seventh Child, which was uh, Sister Collins, uh, Malcolm's sister, uh, book put out by Rodnell Collins, her son, uh, they have brought that out in great detail, how the family was crucial in shaping Malcolm in every period of his life. So that's why really he broke because he needed family around him. That was the nature of him. That ain't the nature of everybody. That ain't my nature. It was my brother's nature. He was a family man. I'm a world man. I care about family. World is my thing. Everybody's got a different standpoint. But the key point is, Malcolm became the Malcolm we know, rose from Malcolm Little to El Hajj Malik El Shabazz, Malcolm X, because of the deep transformation he went through. And by the way, the book I'm finishing on seven, I don't even deal with Malcolm because a lot of people already know about Malcolm. I'm dealing with other masters and their transformations, and I'm dealing with more than identity. And that, in fact, the main part of this book is on the subject I'm dealing with today. My book, The Integration Trap, Generation Gap, Caused by a Choice Between Two Cultures, it covers the identity transformation as well as the Art of Leadership, Volume 2. Um, and a lot of groups, had they had this, when it comes to organizations, they would have done much better. Had the Black Panther Party had a transformational process, they would have done much better. Some people in the party went through that, Sakta Shakur, others. Many did not, including the leaders. But more important, you don't have to be in a group. If you have a deep uh, understanding of who you are and it's embedded in you, in your bone marrow, in your nervous system, you are going to be a much more productive, happy, creative human being. So part of this brokenness uh, that arises, or this sense of brokenness that arises from colonialism and slavery, um, it leads to that. But no human being can be broke. And in fact, the myth that in enslavement they broke us is pure bull, pure bull. And this myth that they dehumanized us, and I keep saying this, and you need to get this straight. There's a difference between conditions and position. So we were in dehumanized conditions, but did we assume the dehumanized position? A few of us did. You have some who uh, cooperated or went along with the master and were slave drivers and would administer the whip and all of this. Very few. And they were shunned in the enslaved community. The majority of our people kept their humanity intact, scarred and with issues. And part of what some people say when they talk about brokenness is some of the scars. But overall, even when uh, our grandparents and sometimes our parents have been hard on us and maybe too hard, most of them had the intention of making you a better human being. And most of them were trying to teach you some discipline so you'd get some self-discipline. They may have gone too far in some of this discipline, you know what I mean? But some of us have reverted to the opposite and haven't gone far enough. We got like white people and we're gonna have our little time out and all of this kind of stuff. Uh -uh. <laughs> you don't have to lay your hands on somebody to get them to act right. So what we've got to really understand is that breaking people is a very, we ain't horses. And even horses sometimes re remember the nature of a horse and will throw you, especially if you pee them off. You know what I mean? Get them angry. <laughs> or sometimes they just be a horse. 
Even dogs will sometimes bite you because underneath that, you know, there is the wolf. But generally you treat a dog good, it ain't gonna bite you, except for Doberman Pinsis. I have a thing about Doberman Pinsis. So the thing is, um, we may feel in, you know, in our hurt and in our pain that we're broken, but the soul and the spirit within is not broken. And whatever you have been brought down to, you can rise above it. Frederick Douglass gave the, uh, the experience that he had of being brutalized and how he got to a point where he was in a stupor until he fought the slave breaker Covey and beat his behind. And he said his manhood returned, his sense of humanity was strengthened. And he said, any man that would put his hands on him again would have to die in trying. And from then on, escaping was secondary. He had escaped from mental servitude. You hear me? So feeling broken and actually being broken are two different things. God didn't create anything that's broken. And, you know, I've, I was re-watching uh, Denzel Washington's portrayal of Reuben Hur Hurricane Carter. What a magnificent human being. Went into prison, refused to wear prison clothes. Uh, resisted every minute he was there. He had been a boxer and was on the verge of receiving, probably winning the middleweight championship until some demonic cop who had been putting him in juvenile and now in prison framed him over 20 years. But the whole time he had a resistant spirit, he wasn't broken. And Geronimo Pratt, who was in prison for over 20 years in solitary confinement, he was in prison longer, solitary confinement. And I may have mentioned this before, he told his daughter to come to me when I was chairing black studies and take my classes. I said, <laughs> ain't that nice? You know what I mean? Big compliment. That brother never lost his spirit. And I'm going to tell you, if anything can break you, 20 years of solitary confinement surely can. But he ain't the only one who has withstood that. So, but when you have a solid understanding of yourself, knowledge of yourself, respect of yourself, and love of yourself, not only can you not be broken, you can break, baby. The system that's trying to break you, huh? take it on in a way that you can win. Like David Walker said in David Walker's appeal, when he was advising slaves to rebel, rise up and be violent. He said, when you see the way, that means when you can get away with it, don't do it if you're gonna get hurt. And I'm not advising violence here. I'm just simply saying uh, breaking, you can break down a system. And this show is really about these discussions here. The whole show that shows is about uh, how we prepare now in the transformation of our lives to transform the society to come, because we're on the verge of that. If you see it, you can believe it. If you have the understanding that with the shift of demographics away from white dominance to black, brown, red, and yellow dominance in terms of numbers, I'm not talking about dominating people, um, then what you need to understand is that's just the first step in a bigger transformation. You need to be preparing for it. But even when it's not happening in its totality, as it happened in your victory against Trump, you have to be engaging in your own freedom, your own mental freedom, your own spiritual freedom now. And so some of the things I'll be offering here are models that you can use now that will definitely work in the just societies of the future, can be used in this country, can be used in Africa, can be used in the Caribbean, in South America, wherever African people are. And some of these models are good for all people. And by the way, the model for transformation of consciousness, six fold stages of mental freedom is good for all people of color. Uh, so this is real key. Um, now, one of the things that can cause someone to feel a sense of brokenness now is uh, what God shared with me when I was dealing with what's happened to our community since 1968. I've mentioned this before, but I just wanna stress the importance of addressing this. 
And so uh, these forces that have hit black communities since 68, that have, uh, that have changed the reality for blacks born after 68. I deal with this among other things in the uh, show um, entitled, Why Are Black Families Weaker Today Than 150 Years Ago? And it's because of the forces that hit our community that we were unprepared for. I've talked about them before, I'm not going into it now, but one is deindustrialization. De took jobs out of the community. And as unemployment figures rose among black men and black women, especially black men, the marriage rate went down from 75% two-parent households since 1865 to 29% two-parent households today. There are a lot of reasons for it, but the key point, and this was the point that God gave me again, uh, experience of the light, not as big as the one that I discussed last week, was to tell me the problem of those forces hitting black communities is it's caused a choice between two cultures, meaning for the first time in our people's history, we have some of our people choosing between this mad, despiritualized, Aryan-based European, European-American culture and our rich African-American culture. And so part of the process of um, being strong and um, you know, being whole is that we need to be able to appreciate the fact that we need to draw from both our African and our African-American cultural roots. The conscious people generally are only looking at Africa. We need to look at both. But you can only do that when you appreciate what you've developed here, because a lot of you think you have developed nothing. And if you have a low view of yourself here, you have a, uh, uh, of your people here, you have a low view of yourself. So this is um, crucial, absolutely crucial, especially for this younger generation. So African and black identity transformation uh, that promotes self-love enables black folks and people of color to be more open to their internal spiritual powers. If you love yourself, then you're not going to have too much problem accessing to the love of God that dwells within you. And um, if you love yourself, you're not going to have too much problem in terms of loving others, those who love you. You don't love your enemies. <laughs> Forget that. I know King said do it, and I know God loves everybody, but it's kind of dangerous. I wouldn't advise that right now like loving the Proud Boys. I don't think so, <laughs> not hardly. And by the way, we are very forgiving people and this is a good thing because if you carry around anger and resentment, that'll eat you up. But what I say is sometimes we're too quick to forgive. Like that shooting that occurred a couple of years ago in South Carolina, that man went in, shot up a whole bunch of people and um, was then taken to a hamburger place and given a hamburger by the cops like a reward saying, yeah, good. And he made it very clear that he didn't shoot himself, which a lot of these serial shooters do because he was proud of what he did. He wanted to be a poster boy for the right wing and blacks were just jumping up in church to forgive him. Well, here's the rule on forgiving. Until the one who's done wrong, whether it's to you or your people, has undergone remorse, seriously transforms his or herself by proof of actions. Until that happens, um, forgiving is a joke. Because you think when you pass on to the other side, you know, those who have done serious crime, you think God is going to say, oh, you're forgiven? I don't think so. And if God, who is the kindest, most loving, most tolerant entity of all the forces everywhere, is not going to tolerate that, why should you? So I'm saying I know forgiving is human and is healing, but under certain circumstances. And you don't forgive somebody that's going to go out and if they get a chance, do the same thing again, you know? And the first thing you need to learn is to forgive yourself because a lot of us run around here with issues and we are constantly judging ourselves too harshly. 
work on yourself, but don't beat yourself up. So last week, um, I was dealing with what the Chemites called the heart mind. And um, this is the Kemetic and also the Chinese and Japanese have gained that concept, I believe from early African culture since the first people in those two countries were also Anu or black. Uh, so we saw that the place where God dwells within us is in the heart mind. Um, what I wanna do is make some distinctions between the brain and the heart mind because this comes as like um, a revelation that your heart could be the seat of intellectual consciousness. It's not so hard for you to believe of moral clarity because you, you think of the heart as feeling. So you might accept that, but the heart, how does it reason all the rest of this stuff? The difference between the heart mind and the brain is that the brain is like a machine. It controls bodily functions. It also controls certain kinds of mind or brain thought, left hemisphere, right hemisphere, more, ra more rational, uh, more intuitive. It controls some of that. And it controls lower thought uh, functioning, you know? But the thing about the brain is, while it is very important and it's one that, you know, you wanna keep in good shape, I don't drink, you know? And one reason is alcohol actually destroys brain cells. That's only one reason. It ain't no good for me, I don't drink, you know what I mean? But the alcoholic industry tells you, oh, you can drink two glasses, you know what I mean? It's okay, yeah, show me the studies, you know? What are those two glasses doing? If you're drinking them every night, what are they doing to your internal organs? Huh? I know plenty of people who the first time they went to a doctor was after they drank for 50 years and they were told, well, you're walking dead. Your liver is gone. This and that is gone. You know what I mean? So uh, brain is important, very important. And they're still learning things about the brain. But recent research, and, and I have a student who is a registered nurse uh, and uh, uh, master dancer. And she gave me a hundred page paper on this research. It was maybe 10 years ago where these researchers have shown that the heart emits higher brain frequencies than the brain. So something's going on in that heart. And of course the heart is like, you know, the uh, central station of life. But of course, this is hard for some of us to believe because we're used to a material explanation for everything. But for everything that you have that is material, there's a spirit component, everything that God's created. And if you don't think that that central organ that pumps blood and everything else doesn't do more than that, well, everything else does. You know what I mean? Everything else in the universe is both matter and spirit. George Washington Carver would tell us that all those plants out there, they have selective properties and powers. And so when you pipe into them, you're actually learning uh, from those plants. So um, I made reference last week to the fact that uh, four or five hours before the earthquake in 1987 in San Francisco Bay Area, my heart, my spirit, what you call your gut, Say, get out of here. Now, I never hear any words. It's a feeling, and the feeling is telling you what it means. And there was no fear in it. There was nothing, no panic. I'm just saying, get out of here. And it didn't tell me why. That's a heart mind. In this case, it's seeing ahead and seeing behind. It's one of the properties of uh, the heart mind. And so when I left three hours early rather than four, it saved my life, probably, because something would have fallen on my head or I would have fallen through something like the bridge all the way down to the water. And so that's a heart mind. That is one level of the heart mind, which is your guts, which is your intuition. And everybody knows here, when you get that feeling and you go against that feeling, something always happens. And then you know you should have followed that feeling. And I do that sometimes. 
But on essential things, I usually don't. And you often don't know what's essential. So you just better listen. And, and when that spirit is telling you, boom, some people will see a person. James Smalls, who's a brilliant brother, South Carolina born, very intuitive, very wise. His main wisdom don't come out of books. He reads, but comes out of wisdom. James Smalls' favorite saying is, my heart just doesn't go along with this person. And if he says that, that means that he is, his spirit has told him there's something wrong with that person. We coming out of straight up Southern black roots and South Carolina is a uh, real African. And he come up out of that, you know what I mean? But it's in all of us. My wife has told me about people. And then later she said, see, I told you, I told you. <laughs> Sisters are more likely to be in tune with this. You know, brothers, Malcolm was running around here talking about what a good judge of people he was, all the rest of this stuff. He's the one that put John Ali into the messenger's office. And uh, he was his second uh, most influential person. And he was an informant for the FBI. You know what I mean? Now he didn't know that, but um, he wasn't listening to that spirit within. And in fact, the spirit within in the form of Reginald was telling him about Elijah Muhammad long before he had his problems in the nation. He wasn't listening. But in this case, he wasn't listening to something outside, but listen to that voice within. So um, the heart mind is the source of creativity and creative ideas. George Washington Carver would go into his uh, um, office, his laboratory, which was made up of a lot of handmade stuff and um, do what he called creative science. And he went in at 4 a.m. because spirits are moving slower, things are quiet, and he's able to tune in to these higher forces. And he, he said, I'm going in to my laboratory to think God's thoughts because he was piping into them all the time. But again, he was drawing from that heart and mind and he was drawing from Sia because he was coming up with innovations that we can't even count. Um, so the heart and mind is a seat of great powers and not in the sense of the Western world of powers to control, but things that empower you. That is the seat of your powers, your heart and mind. Um, now, when we look at heart and mind, I just want to lay out the, the powers that it contains. And I'm not going to specify in name all of them, but I'm going to do the domains and some of which we've covered. It's the seat of intelligence, the producer of thought. That, that, that's, that's before you get to see it. It's, it's basically uh, good thought. The brain is mechanical. This is non-mechanical. Notice people who have been despiritualized. And they, all people, white, black, brown, red, or yellow, are spirits having a human experience. But if their culture doesn't recognize that, then they're going against the spirit. One of the things that happens, and this is kind of funny, I just want to throw this in, you all know this, you may not have attached it to despiritualization is, a people who are bought into a world where there's, everything's mechanical, machine-like, um, free of much feeling and very little kindness. People who come up with a culture like that, they lose that feeling that enables them to dance. You notice? <laughs> they become mechanical. And that's a reflection of something that's lost its higher. And so in most of these societies, they're not good at creating art anymore. I mean, if you look at a lot of this art that is passing on as art is a painting of a tomato can, you know, that's supposed to be art. Or somebody that takes some rusted out car and puts it in a museum, you know what I mean? some Frankenstein stuff, because you're losing contact with that creative part of you. And so if you think that black people have just been broken through enslavement, then you explain to me, how is it that the African-Americans ethos or way of being is creativity? I'll go into that later. I'm not going into it now. The African-American is the most creative African and possibly the most creative person on the planet because we had to be 
It was a nature of our circumstance, but it's because it's in us. You know what I mean? That means that the culture itself has a contact with heart mind. It may not have heard of the word. Just like our mothers have a contact with ma'at, though if you told them, they say, Matt, what, baby? Mom, when you told me not to lie, you know what I mean? Told me to tell the truth. Don't steal. That's my, my oh yeah, okay. Is that what that is? <laughs> oh, you say you're being communal. What is that? Sharing. You know what I mean? It's in your nervous system. So the heart mind is uh, you know, the seat of certain power. So one is the seat of intelligence and the producer of thought. It is also an autonomous principle. It's a companion. You're gonna see when we talk about Ka, what that means. It's a companion of yours, a spirit companion. That's two. Three, it's a faculty of the soul. It's called the Ba. And the Ba has certain astral powers. I'm not going into the Ba today, but a lot of you have Ba experiences. A lot of people do, you know? A key thing about the Ka is it's a source of life. It's, it's called vital force in most African systems. And as long as you have your Ka, you're alive. When you lose it, then the physical body is gone. It goes somewhere else into the spirit realm. The Ka is also your judge. And it's a judge of human behavior. It stores the memories of everything you've done in your life. And it will be used at a certain point, if you can figure out when that is, I'll get into it in a minute. And then at its highest realm, heart mind is exceptional intellectual clarity, um, which is at another realm. And of course, it's a seat of ma'at, heart mind and ma'at, and all the reasoning processes, emotion, uh, heroism, courage, all these things, uh, they also reside in the same, same realm. There's no separation in, in life between uh, emotion and thought, kindness and strength. These all go together. These have been separated in a despiritualized intellectual uh, world. So each human being has the capacity to pipe in to these higher powers. And some of you who are watching this uh, have, and some of you are, and some of you at a very high level, higher than me. Um, so we all have the capacity to pipe into the powers I'm describing with George Washington Carver and with others. Uh, and we have the capacity to pipe into this power of Sia and the Bob, which is an astral thing that we'll talk about another time. But to pipe into Sia, it takes a lot of work because then that's another dimension of consciousness. Um, as humans, we have other spirits that are our companions that are here to protect us. And we pipe into them in a number of different ways. One way we pipe into them is self-cultivation. Part of the drawing on the God within is like doing gardening work. Uh, spirituality or spiritual growth and development is like what you do in a garden. And in fact, when you see uh, every part of life is both matter and spirit, then just about everything you do has a spirit or spiritual meaning and component to it. So when I'm pulling weeds in the garden, I'm thinking about the weeds in my character that I need to work on. I'm an archer. So when I'm using the uh, bow and arrow, the target I'm shooting at is my weaknesses. Bullseye, you know, is like something. But even the bullseye, I'm aiming at weaknesses. And by the way, that, that was just an intuitive idea for me, but when I read about Japanese archery, that's what Japanese archery is, you know what I mean? Because again, they have a spirit-based culture. So anything that um, is spirit-oriented is gonna see it in every area of life. Um, 
I used to think of a job like a banker as just being exploitative. I busted open jobs for blacks in the banking industry, you know, beating the Bank of America. Until one day I'm talking to a student of mine and her mother was a banker. She managed a bank in uh, San Leandro, a sister. And she made this comment. Her mother never gave a client bad advice. Her mother was not out to rip them off. The banks do, but she didn't. She didn't say that, I'm saying that. And, and so then it, it really opened my eyes up to something. It don't matter what your job is, as long as it's not hurting people, if you do it in a way to help people, that's spiritual. So spirituality or spirit is in everything we do, especially when we act with kindness, act with care, act with human compassion. And then as we know, life's a great classroom and the real teacher's crisis. When you go through a crisis, then that's the time where you're really uh, tested. The Buddha uh, said, the main reason why problems in life or a crisis is we don't know how to handle them. We handle them in the wrong way. Well, that's why we're here, to learn how to handle them. And so the old saying, a fall in the pit leads to mother wit. Well, I was listening to a singer a number of years ago, and she had been a drug addict. And so she put the, composed the song. And the song said how she was living in LA, and every time she went down a certain street, she fell in the pit and then got out. And she did it three or four times. What she was telling you is she had been a drug addict, and she kept keeping herself on drugs, kept making the same mistake until finally the last fall in the pit led to mother wit. And finally she had the resolve that she wasn't gonna drink anymore, you know? So the old saying a fall in the pit leads to mother wit. Well, sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't. And sometimes it takes a lot of falls, but that's the nature of life. And so growth on the spirit path has got to do with overcoming weaknesses. And in this case, reflected in the fall of the pits of life. And then have drawing on the inner powers that you have that come from your identity, that come from your God consciousness, that comes from a deep sense of who you are as a person um, that gives you the strength to overcome them. And it's not easy and not everybody does, but that is the nature of life. And I don't put down people who don't. Charlie Parker had been on drugs as a teenager, got off for a while, but went right back on. He seemed to lack the discipline uh, to do that. And by the way, you know, I, I think the two most important qualities we have as human beings is good character and discipline. Discipline, baby. Good character first, and then discipline. Because whatever we do in life, we're going to do it well. It takes discipline. And when we get into the African-American conception of spirituality, uh, we're going to see that discipline plays a big part in this. So last week, I talked about my own fall in the pit that came from my own principal weakness, which was not really incorporating into my being the feminine side. I was strong on the masculine. And so it hadn't been integrated into my personality the way it should have been. And that came from past life issues. Of course, a lot of you don't believe in past lives, but if our journey here is about getting closer to God, do you think you're gonna get real close in one lifetime? And by the way, Christians believed in reincarnation until the Council of Constantinople, where they eliminated that belief and put in its place eternity. So a lot of people, that's their belief system. But whether you believe in reincarnation or not, um, I think it's pretty clear that Earth is a classroom where we're, where we're learning lessons. And the principal ones have to do with our weaknesses. So our weaknesses are a bridge to our strengths. Because the greatest experiences in life are the hardships, the greatest ones, provided that you learn from them. And the worst thing you can do is the woe is me. Why is it happening to me? Getting bitter. I call bitterness cowardice. I've seen people 
black people who have been abused by racism and then turn around. One, one guy I knew he was a great teacher, but being abused by the system, he then began to turn his resentment on his students. And so it's understandable why you're resentful, but um, really facing the crisis and dealing with it, fight it, do whatever you have to do to overcome it, but don't make victims of people who are not criminals. You know what I mean? And in this case, the students who you loved, but now because you're so consumed with bitterness, you know, you're incapable of helping them. And oftentimes that destroys love itself in a personal relationship. So we all know that uh, to draw on these higher powers also, and, and this is something that's basic to African-Americans is prayer. We know that prayer is a very powerful thing to draw on. And of all the prayers, God honors first the prayers of mothers because mothers are the closest thing to God. And generally mothers concerns are about something more than themselves, generally their children. But prayer is a powerful force. I, I ran into a sister years ago <clears throat> who had a lot of problems in life and some negative people had sent some people who had some real spiritual powers to really harm her. And when they tried to, this is spiritual stuff, you know what I mean? Hoodoo stuff. When they tried to, they said, we can't do anything. They said, this woman prays so hard. She's got a protective veil around her. We can't penetrate it. You got a lot of people like that, especially a lot of black people. One thing a lot of black people do is pray. And what I say is, you know, it's an old saying, praise the Lord and pass the ammunition. After you pray, do something, you know what I mean? But if you keep asking the appropriate time, if it's the appropriate request, God is probably uh, going to help you. The other thing about um, drawing on the powers within is to understand the laws of spirit power. And the basic law is like attracts like. If you're positive, you're gonna attract positive. If you're negative, you're gonna attract negative. And there's a lot of problems in the crisis of male-female relationships. And it's led a lot of people to conclude that um, there are no good, in the case of sisters, no good men out there, or brothers, no good women out there. You know? And so they end up getting no good men or no good women. That's because negative thought draws in what's negative. And if that's how you think, that's how you will be. As you think, so you are. I made the point before, thought is matter. Before you can create a material thing, you have to think of it. So this, the law of positivity, you can't get to the positive realm until you're positive about yourself until you know, respect, and love yourself. And then also have an appreciation of the power inside of you. And you know, when you understand this God power, there's no ego in it. God doesn't have no ego, you know? Ego is one of the roadblocks to spiritual growth. Ego is a joke. It's like a, a, a mirage on the desert. You know, it's, it's something you think you have. It's an overblown uh, sense of, something. It's really a sense of low self-esteem, ego, you know, being braggadocious, as we used to say, you know what I mean? That's your ego. And that and as long as that ego's out there, God can't get in. And ego will also get in the way of love, you know? So a lot of what we call fallen or broken comes from the realm of negativity. And so what we have to do is uh, tie ourselves into positivity. And, and the way, the overall way to do it is to draw from positive philosophy. Now I'm a philosopher, so I could get into, you know, African, Dogon, whatever. But here I'm talking about your philosophy of life. And if your philosophy of life is positive, then what's gonna happen is 
your feelings are going to be positive. And if your feelings are going to be positive, your thoughts will be. And if your thoughts will be, the way you talk will be. And if the way you talk will be, your actions will be. And so this is real key. Now, I don't mean by positivity that you don't call a spade a spade and you see something wrong, you call it. You know, that ain't negative. But if you're a constantly woe is me person and constantly fault finding, constantly everything's going to be bad, constantly they're out to get me, constantly, you know, I'm defeated, you know, well, like attracts like, you'll attract that. And that will become your reality. So a part of what the heart mind is about, the God within us is about, is you create your reality. Everything we see around us was created by man and woman, too often man, given the nature of the dominance of patriarchy, you know. Well, women have to be empowered to, you know, create a whole lot more and the world's going to be a whole lot better. So when we understand the inner powers we have, we be careful about what we think about. And by the way, you have a subconscious. You can control your subconscious. And it's a question of the power of your thoughts because the subconscious doesn't think, it's automatic. And so it depends on how you think consciously, how that subconscious will react. So the thing about negativity is, it's like stagnant water. You know what stagnant water is? Good water moves. If water stays in one spot, it gets stagnant and eventually it stinks. You can't be stagnant. You got to be moving and moving and grooving according to what you were put here for. So in the realm of positivity, a key thing as humans is we're here to recreate ourselves and recreate the world around us. And that is truly being godlike because God is basically creator, creative. And that is really what we humans here are doing. When a mother gives birth to a child, that's the highest form of creativity. Man and woman took a part in it, but the woman is really the one who carries it, nurtures it, raises it, hopefully with the help of a man, too often now, alone. Uh, and the woman is then mother and father. But the thing is, um, bringing in life is the highest form of creativity that a human being can express. So, some gifted spiritualists have a saying. They say, there's something God gets out of this creation. Something that adds to God. And of course, this is a different conception of God. Because first of all, he's inside of us. He's inside of everything that God creates. It's, the, it's all the forces, a part of which God distributes to everything God creates. And so what could God get out of this? And um, one of these great spiritual seers said, what God gets is what we add to creation. Those things that we do that advances humanity. God gets that. And that's a part of what God grows from, you know, or at least... God appreciates. It enables God's light to radiate, radiate, maybe a little brighter, but definitely because we have free will on this plane, there's no guarantee of what we're going to do. And so contrary to what you think, God foresees this and God foresees that, he let us have free will. So on this earth plane, we make choices. And the combination of choices we make is your character. And so when we add something really beautiful to creation, that is good for God. So think about that, you know. Now, last week, I briefly talked about my experience of Sia and uh, the experience of the beautiful light or the light of God. Um, all of us are lights. Anyone that's spirit-based can see the light within a human being. All of us radiate light. That's why the spiritual said, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. 
And you really underestimate your ancestors who were enslaved. They were the strongest Africans. And they are the one, they're the reason you're here today. They created the culture that a lot of you don't even know you have. Um, they, they were a dignified people who carried themselves regally, even in enslavement. And that's because they had an appreciation of these inner powers. Remember, they had come from the source and they passed it on from generation to generation. So light is the nature of being human. There's a light within us, many lights. And the question is, what do we do with that light? So Sia, uh, the light of exceptional intellectual clarity rarely shines within a person because you have to work on this to get this. You have to have a mis mission in life. You have to have discipline and you have to know whatever it is that God is shedding a light on. Um, so clarity doesn't just come like that at the SEA level. I have a priest um, in the Yoruba system of, it's called Ifa and his name is uh, Yemi Ili Bogan. Uh, he's an Araba, and Araba is the second highest priest in the um, Yoruba system, and um, a Baba Lao, which is a basic priest, means a father of mysteries, which is pretty much like an extension of the Kemetic mystery system, but it is particularly the Yoruba one, so I've had this priest for a good 45 years. I haven't been initiated. My spirit doesn't want me to be initiated but I've drawn a lot from the Yoruba system as well as many others. And so when I was explaining to him my experience of the light, uh, Ifeyemi, who has written a lot of books, he's a poet and has written a lot of books. He said, well, his inspiration comes from the realm of the spirit. He thought mine didn't. And I said, well, my most important wor works do. And um, they've come from the light. And when I explained the light to him, he said, well, that's the way the spirits used to communicate with us a long time ago. He said, generally, they don't communicate that way anymore. And so I said, oh, that's interesting. And, and so I figured the reason that I had this light experience rather than a dream or something else that could have conveyed this message is that I was drawing on the oldest spirits, the Chua. I didn't know it when I asked the question, what is the basis for the just society? But um, once I got the answer, I knew immediately the ancestors had given me the chua and uh, the formula for how their societies were organized. And in those societies, there was no oppression. So um, that's why I think that my experience has been the experience of the light. Um, now, my experience, uh, with the light, I wanted to share this in more depth because it tells us something about the mind of God. It tells us something about uh, God's nature. Some of this you'll know, but in other cases, the direct experience is a little bit different from just some quote. Um, there's a gospel blues song that my favorite rendition of which is sung by a singer, Tremaine Hawkins. And uh, she was Walter Hawkins' wife at one point. She's a soprano and she's a great singer. And in her coming out album, which she did at the Calvin Simmons Theater in Oakland, uh, where the Dean of the College of Ethnic Studies, uh, Dean Philip McGee, who's passed on now, brilliant brother, he's one of the four uh, innovators in the field of black psychology. He was Dr. Wade Noble's teacher. He uh, was also, in addition to being a melanin specialist and an uh, innovator in black psychology, he was a musician, played piano. He also did the choreography for uh, Tremaine Hawkins' coming out event. Jesse Jackson was in the front row. <laughs> and so she sang this song that is one of my favorite uh, gospel blues songs, and it really describes partially, because nothing can really describe this experience of the beautiful light. 
which is God. Um, and she sang this song, Change, she says, she sang, and she was soaring because it's one of those things where, you know, you get into the moaning and, you know, you get into the uh, blues, spiritual blues riffs. And so she's going off somewhere else. I've heard her sing this song on a recording, nothing like this. And she said, and, and so the song goes something like this. A wonderful feeling has come over me. I'm not what I want to be, but I'm not what I used to be. That's all right. Change. You know? And I was listening to that earlier this week because before I write, I listen to the music. And when I'm studying, I listen to the music. And um, I said, yeah, because the experience of the light came all over me. You understand? And it was such a beautiful, beautiful feeling. And even though I underwent change, and so um, I'm not what I want to be, but I'm not what I used to be. And so it was an improvement, as my mother would always tell me when I'd tell her, oh, I'm doing this better. You know you can still do better. <laughs> so the experience of the light was transformative, but it was so beautiful. I, I want to share this in more depth because this light is the light of God, and this is a radiant light. The one that drove the integration trap book was a smaller light containing truth, but I'm asking in this one, what's the basis for just societies, African ones, but it's designed for what's the foundational basis for changing this one or the world? It's a big question. And so I got this big light and God is a great white light. God is, I saw a part of this it dwells inside of us, but because of a lot of hard work, God was kind enough to share this with me. So um, this light that was all over me was an embrace of God, it was like being hugged. It was a wonderful feeling. Now, when I gave Tremaine Hawkins quote of this song, Change, that doesn't even come close to what I felt because it's feeling beyond any ability to really express what it was. It was so magnificent. Um, and so it was beyond description, but I'll give you the best that I can of it. And it's to, to, to give a deeper sense of what is this God within us? And I know we all have our own contact. So we all have our own experience. So I'm not claiming this is it, you know? The first thing that I would say about this light, this radiant white light, it was brighter than sunlight but you could look at it. And the first feeling I had was a feeling of beauty, this beautiful light. It was beauty beyond description. The only com comparison I could make to God's beauty is if I combine the beauty of all the finest sisters I've ever seen. And for me, it's very hard for me to separate the physical from the spiritual. So when I combine them, when you put all that together, it was beyond that beauty. Um, it was beyond the beauty of mother nature in its most beautiful forms. You've been to places that are just beautiful beyond beauty. You go to the Caribbean, the beautiful ocean hasn't been polluted, you know, or down in Carmel, it's pretty much like that in the Monterey area in California. The beauty of the most beautiful humane characters I've experienced beyond that. The beauty beyond the beauty of the most beautiful music I've ever heard. The beauty of the most beautiful sunset I've ever witnessed. The most beautiful thought I've ever heard expressed by the most beautiful minds. I have never known th that I've ever known that uh, when I combine all this beauty, it's a speck compared to this beauty of the light. 
so beautiful. So, so, so beautiful. I've experienced love. Um, I have a little book right here. My mother put this together when I was born. It's called Baby. My mother was a poet, you know? And um, so she, this book marked all of my stages of growth. I'm the only child she could do this for simply because uh, she had other children. She had time to do this for the rest of them. So I know some of them would probably feel neglected because it wasn't done. It wasn't because she favored me. I was the first one. And by the way, a Leo, she's a Leo, but that was neither here nor there. So one of the things she said is, when I stood up and got to see myself, she said, I giggled, meaning I liked myself. You know what I mean? I ain't never had a problem of not liking myself. And by the way, the color issue, my father was as light as a white man, proud of being black. My mother was just basically proud. That N word was never expressed in my house. And it was race pride. So when I underwent brainwashing, it was not a hatred of my color. You know, it was being on remote control psychologically, mentally. But I never had a problem with this color because our family didn't. It was never brought inside of us. My mother's best friends of all complexions, Ella Hutch, who got me in the movement, dark complexion. Her first friend, um, Novella Body, who was my godmother, as pretty as my mother, black as midnight, my grandmother. You hear me? So I didn't have that issue. I had other issues. Uh, so um, I've experienced love, love of a good mother, good father, um, love of self, and love of my people. I've often said I love my people more than myself, but don't think I'm stupid. I do not mean that uh, I love each individual because I don't know each individual. I love it in the aggregate, meaning as a group, because that group is beautiful. But there's some people ain't worth loving who black. So I ain't, <laughs> no way, positive attracted to positive. There's certain blacks I don't want in my house. You know what I mean? Mm -mm. You know what I mean? Follow up the atmosphere. So don't think I'm being romantic on this. Uh, so I, I've experienced love. But the love that I experienced through the light was an unconditional love that was warm, gentle, kind, and non-judgmental. And that was what embraced me more than anything, was this unconditional love. And this love that we seek to get inside ourselves, both through uh, knowing our own being, and uh, then knowing our African self and then knowing the God within, this experience was telling me just how profound that is in the most powerful, the most kind. It was the most beautiful, beautiful feeling of love I've ever had. Uh, I've apprenticed under some great masters, John Henry Clark, Jacob Carruthers, and while I didn't apprentice under Theophil Obinger, we're close to the same age. The reasons I didn't apprentice under him, I learned from him. And I've been around a lot of great minds and then a lot you read. And then everyday black folks are some of the smartest people I've learned from, you know? Um, so I've experienced wisdom coming from great masters, profound uh, brilliance and also wonderful characters. All these people, had noble characters. John Henry Clark was one of the kindest people I've ever met. I may have mentioned this before, but I had him and uh, Asa Hilliard write the introduction to my most important work, Return to the African Mother Principle of Male and Female Equality. And John was then um, you know, undergoing cancer. And I think at then he was kind of ill. Um, he was the first one to send me uh, his introduction to the book. And when I received it, I've never felt this before, a warm feeling on my stomach that was love. And I called his secretaries who volunteered. These were retired sisters, a nurse, and I don't remember the other one's occupation, to volunteer to work for John in his office. I have a large office here. John's was about the size of mine, but his was in the basement. It was like Bill Cosby's show. 
that had been, I think, a dentist's office. His had been a doctor's office, packed with nothing but bookcases, full of books, 25,000. I got 10,000 here. John, 25,000. And so when I called his secretary, I said, um, tell John I'm so appreciative of what he did. She said, tell him yourself. And I picked up the phone and said, hey, thanks, John. And then when the book came out, uh, it had, I was in Brooklyn and went by his office. And, and it, this is a side point about John. Um, he was as blind as a bat. And so I pick up a book and I say, hey, John, man, this is an interesting book here. John said, it don't belong there. Took the book, he blind as a bat and put it where it belonged. <laughs> And then gave me something to read, told me to go upstairs and read this. It was on the Arabs. And I'll never forget what he told me to read. You know what I mean? So I've seen great masters. John had a saying, he said, his mind was better than any 50 people. I said, no, John, more like 500. You know what I mean? And, and what was key about his mind was he was wise. And he was wise because he was humble. He was one of those noble Southern black gentlemen always wore suit and tie. And when he was in town, because he his family was poor, they were sharecroppers, you know? And uh, he always tipping his hat. And when he's leaving town to begin his destiny, which we're getting into in a minute, and he had to hobo to get to Chicago and then to New York, Miss Chicken Legs, who was um, a lady of the night, who helped raise him, because his family sent him to um, a uh, aunt, and he didn't get along with them. So he went and stayed with a neighborhood group of sisters. And during the Depression, that house turned into, you know, that kind of house. And those ladies in there loved him, loved him. And so when John's leaving with his rags, <laughs> I'm kidding, I don't know what he had, he's going to hobo to Chicago and then to New York because he'd gone to see his master, Arthur Schoenberg, an apprentice under his master. Miss Chicken Leg sticks her head out the window and she says, you see that little in? Now, you know, I want to use that word in this, this show. He's going to make something great of himself. <laughs> John said, that made me feel good, but it it made me worry because I didn't know if I could live up to that. That's kind of like Invisible Man. That's the same thing that happened to the protagonist in Invisible Man when a woman takes him off the floor, 125th Street, after he had passed out, after getting off of a, a train, took him home and brought him back to health. And then she says, I only want you to do one thing. He said, what is that? Do something great for your people. You hear me? So I've experienced this, you know what I mean? And uh, I have nothing but respect for the people that I've learned from. Yet the wisdom that I got from the beautiful light was beyond all the wisdom that I have ever received from the greatest masters. And the profundity of this wisdom, profundity, <laughs> you like that word? <laughs> the profoundness of this wisdom was its simplicity. Because I was asking, what's the basis of just societies? And the answer was so simple that if I had tried to get this for the rest of my life, I would have never got it. You need to read the book, Return to the African Mother Principle of Male and Female Equality to get it. And by the way, it's considered a classic. And by the way, um, this book here. The art, artist is a brother named Oding, who comes from Oakland, master artist. In the Ifa system, uh, you have Orishas, and they're like divine principles. They could be spirits that stayed with God forever and never came to earth, or human beings who rose to a high level and, um, you know, become Orishas. They are spirits and guides. And everyone uh, is, is governed by an Orisha. Mine is Obatala. Obatala is the oldest of the Orishas, the first one to come to the earth at creation. Only one 
to have to be monogamous. He decreed that all the Orishas be monogamous. And I think they said, heck, if we are the second to God, why can't we enjoy some of this? Hell no. <laughs> My nature is monogamous. And I sometimes wonder why all these fine sisters here. Hey, you know what I mean? <laughs> but I just don't have it in me. My wife knows it. You know what I mean? <laughs> and she's got, I mean, you, you want to talk about somebody who loves herself? Oh, she loves herself. So she got supreme self-confidence that knows I ain't going to be playing around. I never have, you know what I mean? But in a polygamous situation, that ain't playing around. And I know the average black man in this country would love to have him a whole lot of women. And some of them do. But in marriage, the sister ain't going for it. And that's why most of you brothers out there ain't able to do it. And you ain't able to anyway, because under polygamy, you got to put your wife in a house, get her cash so she can go into a business and everything she's got is hers. Now, you ain't barely in a position to help put a roof over somebody's head. Help pay the rent. And if you can, get a mortgage. If you can, you know what I mean? So uh, it's, it's beyond you for that. So you need to forget it. <laughs> but I know you'd love it. And I understand why. All these fine sisters out here. But understand, if one relationship is hard, how do you think three of them are going to be? And especially if they get together on you. <laughs> I'm kidding here. So what I could say about the light is that the light of wisdom uh, was so profound and so simple. The formula they gave me for the just society was so simple. And guess what? Since I've done this work, um, I've started to look at how this vision for just family models has been carried into the United States, into the Caribbean, into South America, wherever we are. And I found that Black families that are really balanced, they are drawing from this, they're not conscious of it. The main point I wanted to make about this book is that as an Orisha, the Orisha Abatala is the only Orisha that's linear. All the other Orishans are not. And I'm basically linear, you know? But I didn't write this book in a linear way. And one of the things that I did with this book, because I knew how to write this book so that it'd be easy for somebody to go in and I could lay out the main thing and walk through it. But my main reason for doing this work is to find out What's the basis for taking something unjust and turning it just? In this case, a society. And it starts with the family. Uh, and so when I wrote the book, it, it's for our people. It's for using right now. And it's for human beings. Because by the way, this model is good for everybody. But I knew how to write this the normal way I write it. Linear. And I knew how to do it so it'd just be real easy to get. I use I don't use big words when I write, so it's easy. But I write wrote this book to say thank you to God. And this book is not linear because God's thought is not linear, but also because I wanted to give it, it was my way of saying thank you. I've led a lot of battles. The Bank of America was the toughest. This was a hundred times tougher, 15 disciplines to write. Because when you pipe into God's mind, you get a whole mind. And so you can't get the truth that's conveyed through one level. So all I wanna say is the wisdom is beyond any wisdom that can be expressed. And that's what Sia is for the human being, but God's wisdom is well beyond Sia. And by the way, uh, this level of seer, when you're privileged to reach this level, it's after you've worked very hard on whatever it is your knowledge area is, if it's music or science or history or whatever it is. Einstein, it was quantum physics. Uh, Coltrane, it was music. Whatever. What you get is what in the Dogon system is called Sodaya. It's a fourth degree of knowledge. It's the knowledge of the systems of the cosmos and its ordered complexity, either in part or whole. Some um, Hogans in the Dogon system priests know the whole system. That would be a rare human being. Uh, but in most cases, it's knowing a part of something. 
But whatever it is you get from God, it's an innovation, which in our culture, so dire is innovation. It's new. It's a new school or it's a new breakthrough with no holes. And that's literally uh, what God gave me. And so I'm appreciative of that. And I can never run it around saying, oh, it came from me. It came through me. I did my part of the work, but God gave me the light. And when you get the light, you get the whole picture. And when you're dealing with this despiritualized mind, it's separate, segmented, and you just get parts of it. And that's why people's ideas on the despiritualized the theory level is always subject to change. Somebody writes a book, they got to rewrite it. Why? Because they missed something or they were wrong in something. But what comes from God, no error. The error is with you. So with me, uh, it was understanding the basic truth, but because God is multifaceted, the mind of God is multidimensional. Uh, it's over time that I begin to see more and more and more of what this light shed. I'm a warrior and a spirit person and a scholar. Um, but in all of these, I've always been a peaceful person. I have inner peace. A lot of people don't get it because I have a fierce look. I'm not always smiling. You know, I'm just a warrior's nature. You know what I mean? But I actually have a sense of humor. I don't know if you've noticed. But the key thing is I have inner, inner peace and uh, no inner turmoil. Yet the peace that I experienced in this light is beyond all feelings of peace that I have ever experienced. Peace, calmness, which comes from the loving nature of God. So these are some of my experiences. I'm sharing this with you because I'm sure you've had your own experiences and you have your own um, ideas about this and you should share them. I'm just sharing mine. Uh, but I, I'm saying that this is the wonder that's the wonder inside of each of us. And we have to grow to see some of this. Because there was a time where you wouldn't hear me saying, which I always say now, the spirit told me. You know, There was a time where I would say, the reality of the situation is. Because <laughs> I was on that plane where you see, can't see, touch, and smell it. Well, be careful. You know what I mean? But Long before this transformation, I started to understand how predominant this spirit is. But with this transformation, that has been my, my defining experience. So I just want to make a few observations about God's mind, experience through seer or exceptional intellectual clarity. The mind of the despiritualized mind is logical. It's linear, it's straight up and down, and it's separate. And it is hierarchical, which means it's got a higher and a lower part. So when we talked about the Aryan a couple of weeks ago, which means Lord and Master, um, their view is that their purpose in life is to control, to dominate. That's basically what it means. First to their own people, Arius over Aryan, and then of both groups, over the world. That's been their view. And that comes from a despiritualized mind and over time a dehumanized mind, which despiritualization helps to create along with racism. Uh, so the brain is linear and therefore uh, able to see things in pieces, but not in holes. God's mind is whole. In my experience with Dogon philosophy, uh, which was one of my access points. And you see me, I said at the beginning, I'm wearing these outfits for each of these shows because of honoring Dogon spirits. Um, so the Dogon were really my first uh, entryway into African deep thought and then African American culture, particularly the spiritual blues, which is the high point and the foundation of our art form. Uh, and and it, this is a real key point to get because I think it was uh, Lao Tzu who asked the question of, is the pale fox and his conversations with Ogle Timeli really accurate? And it was a good question. And I'll get into another part of the answer and the question and answer thing. 
But what I would say about this is, I didn't know this is what I was doing while I was doing it. But the key point is, in going through the Dogon system and adopting its philosophy, because I saw that it was a reflection of the cosmos, first in studying it, I began to look at myself. And I think this is the way the system is set up to see if I was in alignment and I could see where I wasn't. And one of the ways I was out of alignment was my thought pattern. I was in the either or thought pattern, good or bad. That's the platonic thought pattern. And so it's through the Dogon system that I was able to recondition my thought pattern over years. And that was to align myself with nature because as we've already said, spirit and matter are one. And so it was internalizing that. And that's what helped me through the life crisis that led me to the light. So one of the things that I've learned in the Dogon system is that because they also have been able to take this whole mind of God and translate it into their systems of what's called the Dunoso, A-D-U-N-O-S-O, which means table of signs. And in my new book on Seba, when it comes out, it's dealing heavily with this. And so what the table of signs does is in the smallest things is everything. So for them, digitary exilis, which is really the symbol for the seed star, Sirius B. But in any adunoso or table of sign that the West calls symbols, but they're not really symbols, is in the anything is the everything. What does that mean? Um, if you look at an atom, it's a miniature universe. Um, and so the electrons and protons, it's a miniature universe. It, it operates the same way as the universe does. If you look at the human being, the human being is a miniature universe that has all the elements of the cosmos inside of each one of us. We're the anything within everything. Um, so in Kemet, the Meru Netra symbols, Meru Netra meaning M-E-D-U-N-E-T-C-H-E-R, God speaks. It's a language of God. So in Kemet, um, this uh, notion of language was believed that speech comes from God. Human speech is Meru Nefer, which is good speech, speech that approximates God's speech. That's why in African societies, cursing and stuff is really out because you're really, you know, your language is supposed to have a divine origin. And if so, you're dishonoring the source, but also you can bring down forces on you. Now we know we've departed from that one. I mean, some of the stuff that's coming out now can't, it's got a curse when they're breathing. You know what I mean? <laughs> Give me a break, you know? So, um, the idea that we're the miniature universe and the larger universe in Kemet, the, uh, the system of Seba, which is the system of teaching, um, the student is portrayed as a five-pointed star, a head, two outstretched arms, and two stretched legs. It's telling you that you are a star, not Hollywood, heavenly, that you are within you that is God, is this stellar force. And those are your gifts. So again, and, and, and I know this is true. And by the way, one of the reasons why you have trouble with this one is they took astrology out of astronomy. And I, I said this before, one of the biggest roadblocks for Afrocentric people is to deal with astrology. Jacob Carruthers was one of my greatest teachers. And he had great tolerance, very humble, but not astrology. If you said astrology, Jake went into fits. <laughs> uh, we were at a restaurant called the Gingerbread House um, in, the eight, in the 90s. Wade Nobles, Leonard Jeffries, and uh, Jacob Carruthers and others. And so Leonard makes this comment. He said, you know, me and um, uh, John Henry Clark, 
and Jake on a Diop were all born in the same month, Capricorns, and Jake went off. <laughs> Only time was actually one of two times where I saw intolerance, and I said nothing. He knew I was an astrologer, too. It wasn't personal. I, I didn't take it personal. But what I'm saying is, um, it's a shame that, that people put this down. And I, I was one that did. I didn't put it down. I just didn't give it any credence until my sister's godmother, who's Mexican-American, her name was Addie, Addie, she did what's called a spot chart, which is you take an ephemeris, which is set up for uh, astronomy to uh, you know, track the movement of planets and especially the heavy, all the planets. And the best ones are German ephemeruses. And so she took that, took my time of birth. And a spot chart is, you know, normally I do a chart, it takes uh, 30 hours to do a person's chart. She did it in about 10 minutes, told me more about me than my mama knew. And I'm, I'm a see, touch, and smell person, so I got to see it. Walk and talk before I believe it. And so all I'm saying is this notion, your stellar matter, but all you have is an idea the stellar realm is material. You don't understand its spirit component. If spirit's in a blade of grass, if spirit's in a tree, you don't think spirit's in the stars and in the planets? Give me a break, you know? As Dean Philip McGee, who was Dr. Wade Noble's teacher, one of the leaders I referred to in black psychology, we were in his office one day, Wade and I, and Phil, who's a master psychologist, I mean, he was a master, he said, astrology is the best system of character analysis on the planet. You're darn right, because it comes from God. And by the way, the Chemites gave birth to astrology. I'm going to go into that another time. There was a time when I taught at state, I wouldn't talk about that because I knew how my students might react. And that was a mistake. I only did it for a few years. It's empowering because it's the best system for you to know your personality. That is your gifts, your strengths, and your weaknesses. Doesn't tell you culture, doesn't tell you race. Doesn't tell you your level of spiritual development. It tells you basic character traits. Now, when we pipe into God's mind, uh, we see that God's mind uh, is many-sided, unlike the uh, computer brain. And so um, it's multi-dimensional, and in multi-dimensional, uh, there are many sides to the truth uh, that uh, God is able to reveal. And so that is really the key point. And I think in life, uh, the more balanced we are, the more value we get out of living, um, the more facets to our life, the more interesting it is, because it's godlike. You know, you're experiencing different realms. The more exposure you have to other people's thoughts and ideas, whether you agree with them or not, you know, then the broader the base that you have to draw from. And more likely than not, uh, the greater uh, your creativity, or at least the uh, potential for it. Now, getting down to the main point. <laughs> I don't do like preachers do. You know, they say the subject for today is they never get to it, but I lay a foundation. So now get this part because all the rest was to get you to this. Um, so my main point for today is dealing with the Ka that resides within the heart mind. When I listed all these characteristics of the heart mind, the Ka was one of them. Um, now, I'm going to use the comedic system of knowledge for what they have to offer on the car. But I'm also going to use the Yoruba, the Asante, the Igbo, and parapsychology, because these systems are in agreement with Kemet. And Kemet has some things to tell you about the car that these systems don't have. And these systems explain some things that the Kemites did not explain. It doesn't mean they didn't know it, but we have not found uh, the uh, hieroglyphics that explain this. But gifted parapsychologists, the Yoruba, the Asante, the Igbo, and many other African people all have the same ideas about this 
and it goes into other dimensions that the Kemites do not go into. The reason I'm dealing with the Ka is, is that it is a component of the spirit powers of God that's within you that is most important because it helps to explain why we're here and how we got here. And it's interesting that in this spiritually empty, despiritualized world, there ain't even any interest in that. Oh, you just pop up in your mama's womb and then suddenly here's the society around trying to shape you, you know what I mean? And so there's no interest in that. And since they're in a, to a see, touch and smell, despiritualized science, uh, a physics that acts like it's material rather than dealing with energy and trying to speculate on what it is. So we often are left without this real understanding. Now, some people are gonna hear this already know this, but a lot of people don't. And I'm gonna say, when I lay this stuff down, whether you believe some things doesn't matter or not. Because the real question is, what does your experience tell you? And in the end, the acid test on this is going to be uh, your experience. So we're looking at um, Kemetic, Yoruba, Asante, these are the people from Ghana, and Igbo, people who live primarily in Nigeria, deep thought on the meaning of the Ka. It helps us to explain why we're here. Now, one of the reasons why I draw from parapsychology is that these are either people who I've referred to before who have died and come back uh, and been on the heavenly plane for a very short few seconds or minutes, simply because heaven's a place outside of time and space, you can experience a lot on the heavenly realm. In, in what would take years in a very short period of time. So um, I look at parapsychology because these are either people who have experienced the other side, the place we call heaven, or the other place we don't want to go and come back to tell it about it. And thousands and thousands of people have left their records on this. And then there are gifted spiritual mediums. And by the way, they transcend any race, though our culture, as W.B. Du Bois said, we're born with seventh sight. You know, we're gifted that way. Our culture is spirit based. But people from every ethnicity, there are people who have these high powers. And they've also seen things. Some of them can see the spirits that we're talking about. What's real key about Kemet and the Yoruba and other African systems is they were as knowing of the invisible realm as they were of the material realm and they investigated it and investigated it through drawing on these higher powers. One of the sayings of many Kemetologists is that Kemetic civilization was patterned after heaven doesn't mean they were all heavenly. It doesn't mean you didn't have pharaohs that were no good. And you didn't have oppression. You did. I'm a revolutionary. I don't romanticize this stuff. But their model was heaven. And what does that mean? Um, one of their fields was geography. The Kemites were good at mapping the earth out. They could locate Khufu's pyramid dead center of the earth and put it there. What inspired them in the field of geography? Their desire to map heaven. <laughs> Think about this, heaven. Because literally um, knowing geography and that was also a part of them uh, also knowing the uh, proper rituals and stuff to worship God and the proper places for that. And so, if you look at what you call art, all of this art, the pyramid texts and stuff like that, that was connected to uh, heavenly scenes of one of which is behind me. You know, we're gonna get into it in a minute. Uh, so their model was heaven, just as America's model is money, power, greed, and oppression, you know? So I'm not saying it was a heaven on earth, 
but I'm saying that they had a heavenly orientation. Look at their pyramids. They were put in places so that they would be aligned with certain stars, the major one of which was Orion. And I'm gonna get into Kemetic and Dogon astrophysics at another time. Uh, so uh, that is the nature of this society. And therefore the unseen for them was even more important than the seen. Remember um, these burial chambers and stuff, they were there to house a mummy uh, whose, whose body had been pre preserved because they believed in immortality. They built pyramids to last literally for thousands and thousands and thousands of years because again, they believed in immortality. And they founded their philosophy on Ma'at, as they said, as the rudder of heaven and the beam of earth. The invisible direction of heaven, which they saw as being uh, directed towards harmony, truth, justice, and right order, and the beam, the central foundation of the earth. Again, invisible, ma'at. And they see that as the order that God digested in creation, meaning God is centered on truth, and that is the basis for heaven and earth. So what I'm about to explore here, uh, these were masters at this. Masters of the invisible as well as the visible visible realm. And in fact, because they didn't separate the spirit from matter, they linked the two. Um, now in Kemet, they convey their messages through Merunetra symbols or hieroglyphic symbols. So I'm gonna get into uh, the Ka and on different dimensions, what is the Ka? And I'm using as my pointing stick uh, a little pharaonic thing here, but mainly because it's longer. And so I'm going to do some pointing to explain this. Uh, so what happens in comedic thought when they're conveying a spirit idea or spiritual idea, they often do it through a material example. So when they talk about heart mind, the picture for heart mind is the actual picture of a heart. How they know that? They gave birth to medicine, Emotep and others. And they did dissection on the body. So they knew every part of the body, you know? So they give you a material symbol to convey an abstract spiritual idea that is real, not something they dreamed up. So the Ka is portrayed hieroglyphically through a picture that captures its essential meaning and purpose. It is portrayed as your identical twin spirit. Every being, every human being has one. So in the picture behind me, you're gonna see a SAR um, who in the West is called Osiris. And he is the founding ancestor of Kemet along with his sister Aset who founded Kemetic civilization. He was a real human being whose head has been found in a, a jar in Obidos, according to Sheikh Ana Diop. Um, so what you see here is a SAR. This is a SAR right here. He's portrayed as a mummy. And he wears the white crown of Upper Egypt. He's a founding ancestor of Kemetic civilization, and he's being embraced by the pharaoh. You know, this is a living pharaoh because um, the way in which his headdress is portrayed. Behind him is a being that's identical to the Pharaoh, just like him, except his hair is white, meaning this is a spirit. And you also know the spirit by his beard, the same beard that uh, Asar has, the white beard is a beard of the deceased Pharaoh. And by the way, in the Dogon Numo twins that I have here, if you remember, the Dogon Numo twins uh, that I showed you before 
the woman wears that same beard, which means a comedic influence. Now, the Ka is your double, meaning your identical twin. The two upraised hands, these are two upraised hands here, that means double. That means this being is the double of this living being. This one's invisible. Over the two outreached hands is the hawk, um, Horus, who is the, um, the netter or principal, the son of Asar, of Pharaohs. And so this means that the destiny of this person was to be Pharaoh, contained in his ka. So destiny in Kemet, uh, the Ka and Kemet meant destiny, and among other things, it meant double, spirit double. And by the hands that are over his head, it symbolizes the, the twin of the human being, in this case, the Pharaoh, and what's over the double hand, double hands, indicates what that being's destiny is. Had he been a musician, it would have been something else conveying that. And I'll show you another picture of the Ka, which shows you just how eerily real this is. This is a picture of a pharaoh's ka, identical pharaoh, identical to that person. You see the eyes, you see the double hands over his head. And this person uh, is King Hor. So you'll note that in that picture, that's an exact replica of a human being. And in fact, it's an exact replica of the pharaoh whore. Uh, so the point is this, every human being has an identical twin. And that identical twin, the Kemites call their Ka. And on one level, it is a spirit double. It looks just like the person uh, that um, it is behind. Now I wanna to go to parapsychology because um, gifted spiritual mediums who can see spirits that we often cannot speak, see, check out what they have to say about this. There's a guy who's a parapsychologist who's able to see spirits and other things and stuff is very good. His name is James Van Pro. Had a book called Talking From Heaven. And so he describes, and he'd never heard a cop. You hear me? He's not into no comedic or Yoruba or Asante or Dogon or uh, Igbo system. He ain't bothered to study it. But he ends up saying the same thing because he saw it. And so this is what he says about every person's spirit double. He says, quote, within your physical body is another body an etheric or spirit body. This body is an exact replica of our physical body in that it contains the same identical eyes, hair, hands, legs, and every other part of the human body in a spirit form, just as that picture I showed you of the Pharaoh. The difference between the etheric body or what the uh, Chemites called the Ka or the double is the way that energy vibrates in the physical body as opposed to the etheric body. What happens on the physical plane is that molecules are a stable configuration of atomic nuclei and electrons bound together by electrostatic and electromagnetic forces. In other words, you have energy inside of you governed by certain rates of speed the difference between the way my molecules vibrate in the physical world and the spirit world is rate of speed. The molecules that vibrate inside of a human being or anything on earth, they, they uh, 
vibrate at a constant rate of speed. That leads to solid. That leads to what you call physical. But what happens in on the spirit realm, and in this case on the realm of the Ka, or in the realm of the devil, uh, double, or many other spirit realms is, that they vibrate, the molecules vibrate at a much higher rate of speed. Consequently, in the subtle dimension of the spirit realm, they don't observe the laws of matter. They go through matter, they transcend matter, and they live in a realm outside of space and outside of time. So it's a very sensitive thing. Now this car that you see standing behind the Pharaoh or your car, looks just like you. The only difference is there's no impurity in it. There's no illness. There's nothing wrong with it. Because one of the things about the Ka is it's your vital force. It's your life force. As long as your Ka is with you, you're alive. If the Ka leaves, it's a part of the death process of the body. And it goes to the heavenly realm. Uh, so this is part of the meaning of the Ka, and the Chemites excelled in explaining this part of the meaning. And spirit, spiritually gifted uh, beings uh, like Van Pro and others uh, have, have seen the same thing. Um, so the, the basic meaning for the word Ka, this is something that Van Pro would understand, is destiny. Um, and so in the case of the picture you saw with the Pharaoh, uh, the spirit behind him with the two upraised hands and the hawk over his head, that means that when this person was born, they had a compact, and we'll see where that compact comes from, to be Pharaoh. And the fact that you see standing in front of this double the fact that you have a fully formed, grown human being with the crown of Kemet on his head or wrapped around him uh, is an indication that that's what that person became. But that was their destiny. But destiny has a little bit different meaning than you think as we get into it. Um, so the picture you see is what this person has become. The being behind him carried that when he was born. And so it's a question of then how he became to be that. So this show is talking about knowing and being our Ka because the Ka is our destiny. And it's what we can be. It's not predetermined. It doesn't mean that it's automatically going to happen. But we'll see what that means in a minute. Now, the Asante of Ghana, they call a person's destiny Kra, K-R-A. And notice, take the R out, you have K-A. This shows the cultural unity of Africa. Um, the Yoruba call destiny Ori, O-R-I, your destiny. The Igbo call it <clears throat> your Chi, C-H-I. All African people have a concept of this because we're tied into origin. You know, we always like to go back to the beginning. And you'll find in Asian and other spirit systems, they don't have this explanation because they don't go far enough back. They do have uh, ideas of uh, past lives and reincarnation and stuff like that, particularly the Hindus and others. But this idea, um, this reality, they haven't penetrated this level. I'm sure they have spirit people who know this, but their systems don't teach this. Now, I also want to thank Dr. Theofelo Binga for some of the insights that he gave me that helped me to further understand this uh, because he reads Meta Nature, so I was able to draw from uh, some of his uh, thought as well. So on one level, the Ka is your vital force. It's your life force. It's your energy. Um, but the Ka is also your wish. Now, this is really important. And it's 
connected to truth, your concept of truth. So the seat of your wish is the seat of your truth. Let me explain that. If your wish is to be an artist, a painter, if your wish is to be a musician, if your wish is to be a physicist, if, if your wish is to be a teacher, if your wish is to be an athlete, if your wish is to whatever, that is gonna be the basis around which your truth is based. It does not mean truth is relative. It means that we each have a piece of this ma'at that dwells within us and the way we express it most fully is through fulfilling our wish being what we came here to be. And so following the truths of that. There's truths of athleticism, you know, there's truths of music and so forth. And does not mean truth is relative. It means that it is your seat of truth because it is how you express your gifts. Um, so your wish is connected to your concept of truth. Um, and it's, con it's connected to your desires. It's connected to your dreams. It is the, the thing that you most deeply want to be. It's the ideals for you that if you're able to live your life according to this, it's what makes you most happy. This is real key about the car. It is your wish. And therefore, if you go through the process of fulfilling it, then it becomes your reality. And uh, Ka is reality. Remember in the despiritualized stuff with the Aryan, the Aryan reality is power. That's it. Morals, uh -huh. let me have some dominance here. That is reality for them. And, and by the way, I'm in the spirit stuff. You know, I'm a warrior. So do not neglect your power. But when you have spirit power tied to physical, political, social, economic, and other forms of power, then uh, you're better equipped to handle things. I'm not negating that. That's very important. Now, the heart mind is also your will. So, 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 you know, get this thing on wish. If you're able to pursue a life where you're able to fulfill your wish, that is the deepest desire in your heart, to try and be that, whatever you do with that, that is where real living is. Not pursuing a life. I always tell my students, man, if you're taking a class or you're going to university just to get a job, they brought you here to work from can see to can't see. If, if that's all it is, this is new slavery. You need to know yourself and be yourself. And don't put money first. Yes, you need money, you need to survive. Poverty is, you know, hell. We're under oppression. Nobody wants that. I'm not saying you want that. But I am saying that if your first pursuit is just money, you're going to be miserable. First of all, you probably ain't going to get much given how this system works. <laughs> but if you do, you're going to find out that if this is not the path that you wanted, like my former student, one of the leaders in our organization, he would be a millionaire, but that was his wish. That's okay. And he's helping other people with it. That's good. But if you're doing it just so that you can collect dead presidents, money can't hug you, money can't love you. But if you're pursuing your wish, your innermost desire, that's the most important thing. And one of the biggest obstacles to this is what people think. Forget about what people think. Don't try and fulfill somebody else's dreams in you fulfill your dreams. And I, I, I'm i not living in a lack of uh, uh, unreal world. I know the obstacles are there. The system is gonna do everything it can to block you, stop you, whatever. But you have to have my grandmother's attitude. And she was one proud black woman. She'd go for a job, her mother would say, they ain't gonna hire you. And my grandmother would say, let them tell me. <laughs> One proud black woman, my great grandmother would say, look at how she walks. 
She ain't got a pot to piss in, a window to throw it out. And she acts like she owns the world. That was my grandmother. She loved herself. And she was one beautiful black woman. She exuded love, you hear me? But she, she had this belief in herself. She wasn't able to fulfill her dreams. She tried to leave something so that her children could. So heart mind also means your will, but it's not to be confused with false will power. Will power doesn't derive from the heart mind. Will power derives from the brain. And it's your effort to discipline yourself to control something. And that's okay, but that's false will. Not the will I'm talking about which is what the heart mind rules. It's a counterfeit will. But the will that arises from your heart mind arises from your real wishes. It arises from why you're here. It arises from what you want to pursue in life, which is your real wish. And it is that consistent thing that if you pursue this, follows you throughout your life. That is the real will that arises from the heart mind, and in this case, arises from the ka. And after a while, when you are on your own road, it's just a natural expression. Me, I'm on my path. I'm in this study, working my behind off, or if I'm in the field doing you know, battles, that's my wish. I'm doing my wish. When I was teaching, I'm doing my wish. And they all work together. And by the way, wish, um, destiny shouldn't be confused with profession. It may or may not be fulfilled in your profession. But it is always pursued through pursuing what you gain the greatest joy from. And that always involves helping others. Because whatever you have as gifts, that's how you grow through uh, helping others. So when you pursue your wish that arises from your heart mind, you are also pursuing your gifts. And this is really what the cause is about. And that's also what Seba is, that star that's within you. Those are the gifts within you, along with your strengths and weaknesses. You come into this world with them. Many people who are on the higher spirit realm say often, the, uh, the professions we pursue in this life are professions we've pursued in past lives. That may be the case, which means then it's drawing from great strengths and weaknesses because there's probably things we have to learn about those things that we've done before. So um, a part of your wish that arises from your heart mind is pursuing your gifts and knowing those gifts. And so when you pursue your wish, your wishes, your deepest wishes and your gifts, then this adds up to what you've done with your consciousness through your life. And that ultimately is the sum total of your character and the sum total of who you are, the sum total of your destiny. My mother passed on it. 2005, she was 90 years old. And my sister, who's an astrologer, I am as well. But you know, being brothers and sisters, we knew our mother. And we said, and this is something you can't always say about a person. We said, she had fulfilled her destiny. A lot of people don't. Because this is a system that has McDonald's destinies for you. It's like a hamburger. They've got you carved out and that's what you're supposed to do. And it's going against everything that you want to do. My mother had three basic dreams and wishes in her life. One, that she have love in her life. She was a lover. You know, she said she didn't care what a man had. She go live with him in a cave as long as she loved him. And by the way, my mother was about as fine as women can be physically. And uh, she was living in Portland and she was working in uh, one of these uh, ice cream shops. And so this black man saw her. This black man had his own plane and his own 
specially made car. He owned oil fields in Oklahoma. He saw her once and then spent a lot of time trying to find her again. He finally found her and asked her to go out. Well, in those days, black people had a sense of being royal. My mother wasn't going out with him on her own, so they had to be chaperone. <laughs> make sure nothing went wrong. Finally, the guy proposed to her. And she said, I can't marry you. And the guy is wealthy, rich, you know what I mean? Not too many black people like him in the whole damn country, you know? So she said, I can't marry you because I don't love you. He said, well, you come to love me. No, my mother said, no, uh-uh. <laughs> so she found love, you know, and my father. Her second goal was to have children. She had three and raised us well. Her third goal was that she teach, either in a classroom or have her own school. The family was too poor to send her to Howard. She was a straight A student. So she set up her own school downstairs from her house. Kitty Land Nursery, academic preschool. And please believe me, it was academic. We knew more than third graders knew by the time we hit school, you know what I mean? But the key thing she learned was to love more because you know, slavery puts obstacles in the way of love. We got confused love, we got all kinds of love. And my mother became much more loving the older she began, you know, became. And she learned a lot from um, the parents that brought her children, brought them, you know, the children to her. She learned a lot from their philosophies and stuff like that. So and by the way, they called her the end of her life. What you know, the whole time she was teaching, one of her kids gave her the name Teacher Love. And boy, she just loved that. That was her, that was her being, Teacher Love. You know what I mean? And my mother and my father supported me in everything I did, even when they couldn't understand some of this stuff. <laughs> now, here's the big question. The, that the Kimites don't answer. It's the Yoruba, the Asante, the Igbo, and gifted spiritual mediums that answer this question. And the big question is, how do human beings acquire their ka? How do human beings get from an invisible realm that some of us call heaven to this visible realm that's called earth? What does Ka have to do with who we are as people and our roadway in life? I really want to say something because we have this pity pot view of enslaved Africans. You know, uh, they suffer from post traumatic slave syndrome, which, you know, there were scars coming out of slavery. And so, yeah, there was, as our people would say, sufferation. But these were strong spirits and they came here, they Africans. Their leaders were not preachers. Our people on the plantation did not adopt Christianity. Their leaders were diviners. And these were people who like my Babalao would look into their futures. All enslaved Africans would say when they were interviewed that that WPA, WPA work project administration interviews, they would say, uh, we went to diviners to get the whippings off of us, meaning if, if the priest could um, divine, you're going to get whipped, then do something to prevent it. Some did, some didn't. But anytime Black people tell you the same thing over and over, there's a standard answer. That's called putting you under the straw because they came out of cultures that knew God was not only in them, but they had a destiny inside themselves. And they were going to that diviner to find out how things were going. They were going to see that if they made an effort to escape, would it succeed? They were going to see how they could negotiate a better life. And they were going to see when in the hell they're going to get free and how is it going to work? They didn't tell no WPA workers that. You understand? So the thing is, they carried this powerful sense of destiny. And before I made a comment in one of the other shows, a good deal of time in plantation enslavement, they lived outside of time because they lived in the spirit realm, outside of time and space. And that renewed them. 
And some of them lived to 123 and 124 years of age, not only because of um, health practices and dietary practices that they carry from Africa, but because of their state of spiritness, their state of mind that was in them. So they had resources that we still have, but some of us don't have in the same way and aren't as strong. So what do the Yoruba say? What do the Asante say? What do the Igbo say? And what do gifted parapsychologists say about destiny, right? They all say the same thing. And I think this is extremely important. And I mentioned a couple of shows ago, Betty Eady, who had gone to the other side, Native American Christian, and saw the same thing. I didn't mention what she saw then. And what do they say about destiny? How do we get it? Um, how do we come from this invisible realm of heaven uh, to earth? They all say the same thing, that spirits in heaven, in the presence of God, picked their destinies. They picked their strengths and their weaknesses. They picked the trials they would go through on earth. And they did this with the help of spirit friends. And with God, they had a compact. And the compact was that when they came to earth, they would exercise free will, that the decisions would be theirs. And God would stay out of the picture most of the time and come in only in emergencies when requested if God thought it was appropriate. You know what I mean? But if, that's the reason they came from heaven to earth. They came from heaven to earth because on earth they could exercise free will and in so doing be tested so that they could come closer to God. So issues they had not resolved in previous lifetimes, they could work out in this one. And so this is uh, the key point. Um, all, of the, all of these systems uh, say the same thing. And they come to earth also because the earth is a gigantic classroom. Uh, a realm of experience where they can really learn. So spirits, brave spirits in heaven line up to come to earth. And when they come, the allotted times are the times that according to the energy fields, which is really governed by planetary motions, because really astronomy, astrology is the alignment of planets according to energy. And certain energy fields are better for certain kinds of development. And so they picked those times to come. They picked their parents. And these are compacts made between spirits who are coming to heaven and their parents. A parent today could have been a child of a spirit who picked their parents today. And some children are older spirits than their parents. You know, that's the way that is. So you don't know by age uh, all of that. And so these are compacts. And we will often say, why, why did I pick these parents, especially the problems we have with families? In fact, I was in uh, Manchester, England. This was in 19, uh, 2005 is when I met my wife right after. And the woman that was going to drive me to um, London, where I ended up staying with the lady that became my wife, we had a spiritual session that night in Manchester. And... Um, she said that her and her sister remember when they picked their spirits in heaven. And then she said, and we picked the wrong mother. <laughs> and I said, no, you didn't. Uh, you don't pick your parents because they're perfect. You pick your parents because they have lessons to teach you. And sometimes it may be through how they handle things the wrong way. Sometimes it may be through how they handle them right and wrong. But you pick them because they can serve as your initial teachers. And at the same time, as parents, they learn from their children. So, but 
that's also a case of someone that could actually remember uh, making the choice. Now in places like India, uh, you have a lot of people who remember past lives. And I, I've seen some shows where a little boy comes back to an older band and says, I want my ring back. <laughs> Guy said, what are you talking about? That's the ring I gave you and gave the year, date and time. You know what I mean? <laughs> well, that was an older person who had died and has now come back in a new spirit form. Now you don't have to believe this, but I'm telling you, um, if this is true, and I know it is, it means you got powers beyond what you think you have. You picked your path, you hear me? Now, the Yoruba say this about this choice made in heaven. They say, achieving your destiny is not automatic. It requires two things, hard work and good character. And that's, as, as I said before, I think those are the two most important qualities you can have in life. Um, now, you may ask things like, well, if you picked your destiny in heaven, did you choose to be oppressed? If you picked your destiny in heaven, did whites choose to be oppressors? Um, what's going on here? There's a saying in Meadow Nature where God says this. While there is wrong in the world, I created the heavens, I created the earth, I created human beings. I did not bring wrong into the world. People did. People, when they got to this earth plane, made their choices. And so... If we're asking, did we choose oppression? I think what we chose was times in which certain spirits thought that if they came to the earth plane at a certain time with certain mission, that they could help advance humanity if they listened to their wish, if they pursued their gifts, and if they pushed on. And that each period in which spirits choose to come to earth, they got to be brave spirits. The ones who chose to come in here in the midst of the slave trade or slavery or colonialism. They had to be brave spirits, but they're coming to advance themselves, to learn from their own weaknesses, but in the course of that, to advance humanity. I know that I chose my car. I know that I chose to be black. I know that because pursuing my life, I know that it's the most rewarding thing on earth. I wouldn't want to be anything else. And we're always saying, you know, there's a song that uh, Pops used to sing called, uh, why am I black and blue? Because black was considered bad. You know what I mean? Um, well, guess why, you know? Because you would face a life of challenges that would give you a chance to ascend if you rose to those challenges and to advance humanity. Those who become oppressors, they made that choice when they got here. You know what I mean? That's their choice. And that's a choice they're gonna have to live with. So this question of destiny is not automatic. And it is not a concept that only great people have. All people have destiny. So that's a part of the God within you. It is the choices you've made in heaven that you can pursue on earth. Well, you'll say, how do I know what choices we make? The Yorubas say that we forget uh, the destiny pact we made in heaven for a lot of reasons. One of th that they give is that if you knew the destiny you chose, you might get lazy. You might think, well, I'm destined to be rich. I'm destined to lead something. I'm destined to this or that and might not put out the work. And there are probably other reasons that you forget it. But I say on this destiny question, there are two types of people. The type like my mother that knows. She always knew what she, what she was going to do. When she was a straight A student, they're telling her to major in home economics. When they told Malcolm to be a carpenter, that drove him into the streets. My Because that was the way Malcolm was. He was more group oriented. What the group thought affected him. My mother was self-oriented. She said, like hell, 
<laughs> like hell, and she pursued her dream. But either way, one type of person is the one that knows their gifts. They don't remember the destiny compact in heaven, but they know their gifts. And there's others like me that have to find out. I never had a clue that I was going to be leading a movement, that I was going to be teaching, that I was going to be a writer. Now, had I been more introspective, I would have figured out, well, these are gifts, but I didn't know. So either way it goes, destiny is like a door, and there are opportunities in life where the door opens. And very often, you don't know fully what's on the other side. Listen to your heart. And if your heart thinks that it's right, do it, not blindly, but do it. When my mother's best friend, Ella Hill Hutch, who was the mother of the San Francisco Freedom Movement, first black woman elected to the Board of Supervisors, uh, one of the kindest women I've ever known, uh, she tells me, my name was Bill Bradley then, she said, Bill, you need to go to a core meeting. Well, she was co-founder of core. I didn't know what core was, but I had saw the Montgomery bus boycott. The student sit-ins were going on. And so I went. And I realized I didn't know all of what was going on, but I realized it was important and I got into it. And I, I had no motive of leading anything or anything like that. I wanted to help, to contribute to my people. And it's that that was the classroom that taught me who I am, woke me up, turned me into a scholar because up to that point, I was reading the wrong books. My mind was on the plantation and I didn't know it. And so that door, that destiny door opened up. And when I walked through it, changed my life. And that's the way destiny is. There's opportunities. But those of you that know, you're more conscious, you're out there making the choices. And those of you that find out, well, when you get the opportunity, you take advantage of it. So destiny is a very powerful part of your God force. That compact you made in heaven, you wanna know it, check your gifts out. Your gifts are the path to understanding your destiny. Work on your gifts, work on them. And I don't care what they are, as long as they're for the well-being of humanity, pursue them in whatever way you can. Because if you want to be depressed, one of the easiest ways to be depressed is to have the opportunity to do it, to pursue your wishes and not to do it in favor of a car, in favor of a house, in favor of some money. You know what I mean? Yeah, you need a house, a car. Yeah, but that'll come. But are you doing what brings you joy? So this is the purpose of this discussion today. A part of knowing God within us is knowing and being our ka or our destiny. We are all destined to greatness. I have a neighbor who lives right in front of me. He's incognito. <laughs> One of the best human beings I know, but there's a lot of brothers like him. I'm not going to put his name out there because he likes to be incognito, but he watches my show. So when you watch it, I'm talking about you. This is a lot of people, and this in case, a lot of black people. Great family man. That's his thing, family. Three daughters, two identical twins. <clears throat> the third one, uh, a, uh, a young lady. All went to UC Berkeley. Two of them got masters, one in um, city planning, uh, the other uh, in ethnic studies. The one in ethnic studies, a little rebel. Now he's got seven grandchildren, the majority of them males. And two of them have already finished half of college and high school. But Joe is somebody, well, I, should, I, should, I, should, well, I won't give his last name. This brother is somebody who's satisfied because with life, because he loves himself, he loves his family and he loves his people. 
and he's incognito. He ain't running around saying, I'm the greatest, but he's the salt of the earth. We got a whole lot of black folks like that and a whole lot of people, period. And they're happy because they know themselves and they're being themselves. And then they set a standard for their children. We always talking about dysfunctional families. We got them. And even the most functional has got some dysfunctionality in them, but we got a whole lot that are doing great things too, you know? And a whole lot that were dysfunctional, we came through and we learned from that and we rose to be better. A lot of brothers and sisters who didn't have a father, who resolved they would be a good father, or who mothers weren't all that great, who resolved that they would be good mothers. That's also the test of life. So I'm ended on this. I'm just going to say uh, all people have these gifts, but you have a culture wired for you understanding these gifts. Go inside yourself. That's where your greatest powers are. Know yourself. Love yourself. Take those gifts you have and work on them so that you can put a smile on other people's face. I hope you get this. I love doing this. And by the way, I want to say again, for the people who haven't done it, hit the subscriber button. I need to get to a thousand so that I can get some things like putting something under my screen that I can't do right now and get on faster alter rhythms. You know what I mean? So uh, encourage people to subscribe to this if you enjoy this. I know I am. And this is a tremendous amount of work I do to put into each one of these shows because I want to give you my best. And in return, I want to get what you have to offer. So I just want to say, Hotep, I hope you get it. I love you. And I hope that um, this is something that will be useful for you. And uh, I'll go for what I can get on um, some of the questions. Uh, Robin Hughes, that was my question. How can we get your book, Dr. Tashaka? Uh, you go to Gumroad and uh, you can get the integration trap. And I asked my uh, computer expert to uh, put my other books up on Gumroad. And uh, that way you can do your order directly through Gumroad and then we'll send you the books along with, we send you a summary of the sixfold stages to mental freedom. Lao to Zoo, Dr. Tashaka, thanks for the reading list. However, a number of the books are not available. Do you have any idea of how these books can be secured or brought back into print? Thanks. Um, you'd have to let me know which ones. And sometimes it's just a problem. And maybe in a few rare cases, I might be able to uh, share, I might be able to copy a book, but I can't, but that would be costly. Though here, I think the only cost would be toner and paper, but uh, I can't do too much of that. Uh, but um, Lau, send me the books that you're not able to get. Uh, Cinnabar uh, has a question. Um, is Ma'at the greatest good for the greatest number? Yeah, um, the greatest good period, because it's not just for a majority or a minority, but Ma'at is basically truth. It's a lot of other things, but if you want to just get down to it, it's true. And, you know, the Kemites are, and African people are very basic. So, if you want to summarize, it is speak truth, do truth. And of course, what is truth? It's in your heart. You know, so that is the essence of it. And if you pursued this in societies, then you would have what we had in the communal orders where people are not flat on their backs, hungry, having to prostitute. As Sheikh Ana Diop said in ancient Africa, there was no systematic mistreatment of women, for example. That's an indication a prosperity in the society at large. And that's because no one could have the private property and land, air, and water. 
that's one of the most despicable ideas that is coming to being. I know a lot of you have trouble with that because you want your house. Africans had their own houses. That wasn't the issue. The issue was who owned the land. They had the right to use land and they had the responsibility to leave it in better condition than they received it. So that doesn't prevent prosperity, communal sharing, uh, but it prevent, it checks greed. This idea, Native Americans, the first thing they faced with white people was fences and drawing a, uh, a line and saying, this is mine. What tree acknowledges you own them? And by the way, they're a spirit force, you know? What deer? These deer, I live up in here in the country, in the city, and the deer around here, they, they don't have to rent. <laughs> this is their land, you know what I mean? And I, I, I try and not to scare them or anything and not to go outside when they're there or to go out the other side so they don't run off so they can do their thing. And not to get too close either. Some diseases you can catch when you're too close to animals. You know what I mean? So, um, yeah, it's um, it's a greatest good for the, it, it's more than that. Uh, Diane Littles, thank you, Dr. Chishaka. How can we communicate with you? Uh, one way is through my email, O, T is in Tom, S is in Sam, H is in Harry, A, K, A. O and my last name, T, S, H, A, K, A, at S as in Sam, B is in Brown, C, is in call sbcglobal.net o tashaka at sbcglobal.net uh, and i communicate with you and then if some people are on facebook you can communicate me with, with me that way i've been uh responding to a lot of uh facebook uh friends lately um Sister Anderson, Miyakia Anderson, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom with us all. Um, family life, I needed to hear this brother. Thank you for speaking the truth. Uh, family man for life, right on brother. Um, and then David Collins, heck yeah. <laughs> uh, Robin Hughes, this is excellent. Um, and uh, Cinnabar, hello, Robin. Uh, so there's some little messages going on here. We go up. Let's see if I can get any others here. hard for me to get this thing moving here. So are there are a few more comments here. Well, that's all I can see. Um, so I want to thank people. I hope you got something out of this. Um, and two weeks from now, I'll be dealing with the spiritual blues and um, that will go into um, the foundations of the African-American art form, the African foundations. And then uh, two weeks from now into the philosophy of the spiritual blues, we'll have something for you uh, next week. So I wanna say to all of you, um, I've enjoyed this. Hope you got something out of it. Hotep. Okay, I see something here from Robin Hughes saying, Gumroad isn't showing it. Uh, Robin, send me uh, your message through my email and then I'll hook you up. Um, and my uh, computer man will give me the directions to, to how to show you to get to Gumroad because I just filled some book orders uh, a couple of days ago. So people are getting it. 
but uh, pro probably something else that needs to be done. So I wanna say Hotep, till the next time.